visual. We are audio and visual. Yeah, we're recording now, Dr. Grinspoon. So yeah, we are video and audio. This is Off the Cuff with Dustin Chandler. I've got Dr. Peter Grinspoon uh, with Harvard Health uh, joining me today. Uh, we are audio and video because we want everybody to look and see how good looking you are, Dr. Uh, Grinspoon. <laughs> I was better looking before seeing patients for about eight hours. <laughs> yeah. Hey, listen, you know, I wanted to have you on today uh, to talk about uh, medical cannabis. As you know, you and I have, uh, spoke offline about uh, the medical cannabis legislation that we have uh, really waiting on a vote uh, in the House. We hope we get to that vote uh, pretty soon. Uh, and I wanted to have you on to give a different perspective. We've talked to uh, some uh, a really uh, prominent physician here in, uh, at UAB. Uh, Dr. Jersey Slavarski is the director of the Epilepsy Center at UAB, and he has spoken to us about a lot of the data that's out there. But I thought it was important. Uh, I know that you have championed uh, medical cannabis uh, much of much of your life. Uh, and I just wanted to give everybody a different perspective. So I appreciate you coming on, agreeing to come on and talk with me about this and just share a little bit of the knowledge that you have uh, and hopefully educate our listeners and the people that watch this. Uh, educate them on medical cannabis. So I appreciate it. And I'll just start out just a little bit about your background. Um, you know, I know your father was a big uh, a researcher. Uh, it's kind of in your blood to be a, a physician and a research doctor and a, and a physician. And now you're teaching at Harvard. So I'll just let you begin with your background, uh, what you want to share with us about that. And then we'll just kind of slide right into the discussion. Yeah, no, absolutely. I've been involved in the medical cannabis issue my whole life. Literally, my brother Danny um, fought against leukemia, he lost that battle. But medical cannabis was the only thing that enabled him to hold down food for the last year of his life. So I saw firsthand that medical cannabis can allow people to live with dignity and could die with dignity. Um, it was the only thing that enabled him to hold down food. So I was um, had firsthand knowledge of how effective and transformative it could be. I mean, there's a reason why 94% of Americans are in favor of legal access to medical cannabis. Um, it's because it makes people's lives better and it's often much safer than the alternatives we use, the opiates and the heavy duty sedatives. Um, it's been an incredible success across the country. And I've been involved in my whole life um, because as you mentioned, my father was a very famous um, activist. He dedicated 50 years of his life um, to legalizing cannabis uh, for medical purposes. And then um, I've been involved in treating patients essentially my whole medical career uh, for about 20 years. Um, I was so impressed, not only with the effect it had on my brother, um, Danny, but also on my patients. I've had so much success treating people with chronic pain, treating people with insomnia, treating people with anxiety. And again, it is it doesn't work for every everybody, cannabis. And it has some side effects like every single medication that I prescribe as a primary care doctor, but um, it is so often uh, safer and more tolerable than the alternatives we've been using. It's a natural plant medicine that, that patients really find helpful. So I've been teaching as well. Um, physicians have been very miseducated on this subject. Un unfortunately, um, because of the the war on drugs, which our society is, is by and large rejecting. They don't really believe in locking people up for nonviolent drug offenses anymore. Luckily, we're moving away from that. But because of that, a lot of the drug education was just really misleading. And that includes the doctors. The doctors were fed a line of complete bull. Um, and now the doctors are very, very hungry for accurate information about medical marijuana especially because the patients are so interested in it and the patients are doing so well with it. So I've been very busy as well, educating people at Harvard and, and elsewhere about the benefits and the harms of medical cannabis. Just like, again, any medication, there are benefits and harms, and it's a question of using it wisely and using it safely. Yeah, you know, and, and that's a very valid point. Um, you know, here we are, we have got a piece of legislation going through that allows physicians to recommend uh, medical cannabis, though they have to be educated themselves. Uh, I agree with you that, um, and I've spoken to a couple of uh, physicians that say, you know, uh, the doctors, they really need educated as well. And and so this provides for that. They, they have to go through the education first in our legislation, and then they can help their uh, their patients. Uh, but I think that's very important point that you make about nobody is saying 
that I speak with and that that I agree with in this, um, I guess, trying to pass this legislation here in Alabama, nobody has ever said that this the medicinal use of cannabis is not dangerous. I think that's very important to point out to to everybody that looks at this as a possible remedy uh, for uh, an ailment with their physician is it's it, it, it can be dangerous. I mean, it could have drug interactions. But the point is and I'll let you uh, speak more to it. Uh, so is everything that we really take over the counter medication can be very dangerous. Uh, we have to be safe with this. And in my opinion, I believe, you know, a, a patient needs a physician's help to kind of work through those things for their ailment. What say you about that? Well, absolutely. Um, again, I've been a doctor for 25 years um, and I prescribe medications all the time and they all have side effects. There's no medication I prescribe, especially now that we're not allowed to prescribe placebo pills anymore because they decided that was unethical. There are no medications that I prescribe that don't have any side effects. Now, there's, let's take chronic pain, for example. Uh, does um, Tens of millions of Americans have chronic pain. As we get older, uh, a little uh, rounder and more arthritic. And, you know, what are we going to use for chronic pain? Tylenol doesn't do anything. Nobody wants to be an opiates. And if you take enough of the, the non-steroidals, the ibuprofen, the non, uh, you know, the Aleve, the uh, Advil, you're going to wreck your kidneys if you don't get a heart attack or an ulcer uh, before you get to wrecking your kidneys. And um, you have a very hard time saying that, first of all, no, no honest doctor with a brain would argue that uh, opiates are safer than cannabis. You can't make that argument. Cannabis is much safer than opiates. If it's very, very strong pain, you might need opiates because opiates are stronger than cannabis. But for much of the chronic pain, you could use cannabis and nobody's ever died from cannabis ever, period. If they say that anybody has died from cannabis as an overdose, they are lying. So it is much safer than opiates. And you could make a strong argument that it's for the long term safer than the non-steroidals that everybody's using and destroying their kidneys. Now, it used to be the case that when people use medical cannabis, like when my brother was sick 25 years ago, you just had access to whatever the drug dealer sold you because it was illegal. But now, for example, in Massachusetts, where we have medical marijuana, it is so carefully regulated that the stuff that people get in the dispensaries, there's no fungus, there's no lead, there's no heavy metals. You get a readout of exactly what's in it. You could get less THC, which gets people high. You could get more of the other medicinal uh, properties like CBD and the other ingredients. And um, it's just really amazing how even safer and more effective it is because you can, you actually have so much more choice and control now that it's legal medicinally. People get access to this safe product. They know exactly what's in it. You don't have to smoke it. You could take a couple drops under your tongue. The doses you need for pain are often very low. They're often not impairing or very minimally impairing. If they're impairing, you could take them at night and you can get a good night's sleep. There's excellent evidence that cannabis, for example, works for chronic pain. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences report from the U.S. government, which is not a cannabis-loving entity at all, uh, in 2017, concluded that there was substantial evidence that cannabis works not only for chronic pain, but for chronic pain, for the insomnia associated with chronic pain as well. So um, we're just finding medical cannabis to be a great way in terms of harm reduction to get people off much more dangerous drugs, particularly opiates and a lot of the sedatives that people are using for um for sleep and for anxiety, which really mess up their memories. So yeah, we've been having a phenomenally successful um, experience with medical cannabis in Massachusetts. Yeah. And you know that, and another good point that you make is that we are looking at in this legislation, because we're talking about Alabama's legislation a little bit today, that that is exactly what this is would set up. This would set up a, a program to which you could get the, more purified, you know what's in it, uh, you have a physician's help for one, you have a place to be able to uh, purchase it and uh, obtain exactly what's in there. The physicians uh, would be allowed, like you uh, uh, put a little bit earlier, 
you can go up in certain uh, components or compounds and and down in others. Uh, so it's very controlled. It is not a it's not really a willy nilly approach to where you just go get something uh, and you don't know what it is. Uh, that's that's what's happening today in Alabama. Uh, you know, we've unfortunately had lawmakers uh, a couple sessions ago say, uh, you know, his opinion was, well, cancer patients. Uh, well, those cancer patients, they're already getting their uh, cannabis on the corner. Well, and obviously he, he said that on radio and obviously it kind of made everybody perk up. And, and you know, why, are, why would we, uh, if we have an opportunity uh, in other states, this is not a novel idea. Other states have done this and, and other countries. But why would we want to turn patients that are, are really sometimes terminally ill? Uh, they could have gotten a diagnosis. Their physician thinks they can help them uh, with uh, medical cannabis. Why would we turn them into criminals is is beyond me. Um, and we know there's there's research. And listen, you uh, you have a very personal tie to this uh, with cancer and and things that are involved with cancer with your bro brother, Danny. Uh, and, you know, that was back in a time where, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, you know, it wasn't he was using, like you said, what he could get. And, and he didn't have the. Uh, the benefit of really getting and knowing exactly what was what he was using, uh, for the lack of a better term, really kind of he just didn't know every time. Well, now we have a place that we can help people like Danny um, that are going through that and we can know exactly what's in the bottle. And that's very important. I have a, another patient um, who is a veteran from the Vietnam War, and he has such bad post-traumatic stress disorder. And the medications are very ineffective for post-traumatic stress disorder. So what he was doing is he was taking six shots of vodka twice a day to control his flashbacks. And it was just awful. He was staying in his house. He wasn't seeing anybody. He was isolating. His marriage was in, in very poor shape. And then we started him on just a few drops of medical cannabis twice a day. Um, it doesn't impair him. It just takes the edge off. He's completely off the vodka He's going out during the day with his friends to like the veterans affairs um, hall and hanging out. He's going fishing on the weekends. He's totally got his life back. And there's no other medication that would have done this for my patient. And like, so here's this veteran. I mean, he deserves as much. He, he gave to our country. And it just seems cruel to not allow people to have access to this, this uh, natural plant-based medicine. I mean, as long as you're working with a doctor who, as long as he or she knows what to watch out for, you know, of course you shouldn't drive on it and you want to be careful with pregnant and breastfeeding women and you want to keep it away from teens. But the funny part is not even in the States where they've legalized it for recreational use, let alone medical use, the, the rates in teenagers have stayed the same or gone down. Uh, the prohibitionists just flat out lie about this, but the, rates among teenagers have either stayed the same or gone down when they've legalized it recreationally and or medically. And some people theorize, is it just like it's no longer forbidden fruit? Like who wants to yes. use the same substance that your grandmother's using for her arthritis? Or the other thing is that like, you know, drug dealers don't card people. They just sell it to whoever. But in Massachusetts, for example, you try to buy it at a dispensary and this big, you know, security guards like, where's your ID? Where's your medical cannabis card? Get the heck out of here if you don't have that. I mean, they're really strict. So there are different theories. But the fact is, it's actually has not been a problem at all with the with the teenagers. Um, it's just been uh, very successful in terms of um, the regulation. Yeah. And, you know, that's one of the things that uh, opponents of the legislation they point to is, you know, one, if if we pass this, uh, which is if 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 those opponents would actually take time to read our legislation, it would be hard to make this jump from here to recreational. But they say if we pass this, uh, the next step is indeed going to be recreational. That's all that the advocates of this bill want, which is not true, not from this advocate. Um, that is not where I, I, I want this to go. Uh, I want it to go to help patients who really need it. The uh, and want access to medicine. Yes. Well, and and do, there are people that want access to recreation, well, but the yeah. patients want access to medicine. Well, and what I want to tell people is, you know, recreational uh, cannabis use is happening today as we speak in every state. Um, it's already taking place. So we, are we going to, as a society, we have a chance to help out 
a physician who wants to help his patient and a patient that wants his help uh, of, or her help from their physician, are we just going to toss that aside because of something that's already taking place? I, I just don't think that's a, a smart way to do it. But they always point back to what you just alluded to and really just uh, really blow up that argument uh, that if we do this, then then the youth of Alabama are going to be turned on to uh, more drugs. They're, it's going to increase cannabis usage uh, in our youth. Um, and just what you just said, and, and it's important to hear that everybody is that even in states that have legalized recreational along with medicinal or medicinal and then recreational, uh, which is not what we're doing in Alabama, the, the use should stay the same or went down. That's what the statistics show. And, and Dr. Grinspoon is, is here telling us that we have to listen. And this is what I've been really uh, trying to put out there. Dr. Grinspoon is experts like you and others the information for people to do their own homework on this issue. I think if if you listen to either side, uh, you may talk to people that want to to do one thing and then you'll, you'll talk to the opposition and you get you only hear, I guess, what they're going to put out. I'm trying to put out just the information for people to do their homework, to make their own conclusion and to see these are leading experts in our country like you telling us, you know, this is something that can help the suffering in our state. It's helping it, uh, the suffering and, and other people uh, in other states and the suffering in their state. And it's just not showing that the fear card is what they play a lot. And that's when they bring the youth and, and everything. And I will tell you, they they make the comment, well, what are we going to what are we telling our kids by passing a medical cannabis bill? And my answer to them pretty quickly is the same thing that I've told my 11 year old son, the same thing is that, you know, this could be, uh, you know, cannabis could be something that you shouldn't do. It's against the law on one hand. And you know what? It could be used as medicine and you have to have a doctor's uh, or a physician's uh, help with it. And it actually has helped his sister in the form of CBD oil. And he has seen that. So I think it's a lot, of, obviously, to explain, but to explain it just like I've explained it to my son. And I truly believe cannabis is something that maybe if it's illegal, you can't do it. Uh, if we can find the medicinal benefit, which I think we have, obviously the data is showing, uh, then it can help a lot of people. So they they worry about the youth, and this is opening up Pandora, uh, Pandora's box, uh, and I just don't see that as being the case. But but going back to some of these ailments, just briefly tell us in in your um, in your research, really research helping patients. I would say, what have you seen the benefits of uh, medical cannabis? What do you see it helping? Um, in your patients as far as their quality of life. You mentioned PTSD, which is a very, oh, yeah. a very big one. Others. But first yeah. of all, let me remind your readers, uh, your listeners, that cannabis was legal in the United States until 1937. Yep. Um, and then the government made it illegal, not for any health or wellness related issues, but just because there were other industries that wanted to nose in the alcohol industry and the hemp in, and the paper industry and so forth. And the American Medical Association was very much in favor of keeping it legal because it was a very popular and helpful medicine all through the late um, 1900s in the early 20, 20th century. So cannabis um, used to be and, and is again in, in, in most states in this country, a legal medicine. So it's not like we haven't done this before. It became illegal in 1937, but it had been a tradition of being legal in this country. But um, William Osler, who is the father of modern medicine, he's literally the most respected doctor on the planet. He said about a hundred years ago that cannabis is the most effective treatment for migraine. And nothing's come along since then um, to to contradict him. It's, it's very effective for migraine. And, you know, the pharmaceutical companies come up with these really expensive <laughs> medications. But sometimes, and for some things, they are much more effective, but sometimes a natural plant-based medicine is more effective. So I would say migraine. Um, for anxiety, um, it is helpful. Though cannabis is interesting because in low doses, it's extremely effective for anxiety. And in higher doses, it can actually make anxiety worse. So a lot of what I do is I counsel people, start low, go slow, and keep the doses down. But keeping the doses down is good anyways, because most patients don't really want to be impaired. You know, again, recreational users want to get high. That's why they use recreational marijuana. But most medical patients 
don't. So we keep the doses low anyways. So I would say for anxiety, and as I mentioned for insomnia, it's actually wonderful for insomnia. It doesn't have the side effects that like Ambien or all those drugs where you wake up and you've eaten your way through the refrigerator, but you don't remember doing it. And you're like, who left all these wrappers here? And you don't remember that it was you. Like Ambien's a lethal weapon. Like cannabis is so much safer than many of the sleeping medications that we use. And our society has an insomnia problem. Uh, you know, part of that's because we, including me, drink too much caffeine and watch too much TV and don't get enough exercise, but none of us sleep very well. And as I mentioned, chronic pain affects uh, tens of millions of Americans. So that's really important. And then colitis for colitis symptoms and irritable bowel. Uh, irritable bowel is incredibly common disease with the muscle spasms and the cramping. Cannabis is quite helpful for that. And then there are diseases like... Um, you know, of course, there's uh, chemotherapy-induced nausea or vomiting, um, you know, which my brother suffered from when he was eight. When I was eight, he was 16. Uh, that's incredibly successful. Uh, you won't find a group of doctors more supportive of medical cannabis than the oncologist because they just see how much it helps their patients. Um, End-of-life care. Uh, when my father passed away last summer, we only needed to use two doses of morphine to get him from this world to the next one because we used medical cannabis in his care. And the difference is if you use tons of morphine, they're just completely drugged out and sedated. I mean, that's good if you don't like your relative, but if you like them and want them to be uh, engaged and get to enjoy and participate in their last days and weeks of life, medical cannabis is way better for the end of life care than opiates are because you could participate in life. So end of life care is a crucial, crucial one. And then I can go on and on, but a really yeah. interesting new one is chronic itching. There's no good treatment for chronic itching. Now chronic itching is worse torture than pain. And they're finding the cannabis is incredibly effective and they haven't quite figured out why, but for chronic itching. So if you're ever suffering That's interesting. from chronic itching, you will, really very much want medical cannabis to be legal in your state. Yeah. You know, and, and so having these discussions with, with experts like yourself, it really brings up the, the point, uh, you know, because it, when you're in this discussion or this debate um, with, with the opposition that does not want medical cannabis or, or anybody that wants to debate it, you, everybody always wants to point, well, there needs to be more research. And they always, they will always say, well, we want medicine. If it's truly medicine, which they say the, the opponents here in Alabama have said that's a myth that it's that it's not medicine. But any medicine should go through the FDA process, and that there needs to be more research. But hearing an expert like you that uh, you manage patients uh, on a daily basis, I mean, there has been research done on this on this, and like you said, it was it was legal up into uh, the the mid to late thirties, I guess, and now and then it was illegal. So, what can you tell us about the data? or the research that has been done, including in other countries and in this country and, and kind of well, because they want to say there's no research behind. out there. The U S is falling behind. It's legal in Canada. It's about to become legal in Mexico. It's legal to do research in Israel. Uh, they're doing research all over Europe. We're just falling behind. It's not that there isn't research. It's just, we're not doing it, which is so sad. Uh, we're doing some of it. Um, but it's still because it's schedule one. Um, the U.S. government has always had it out for cannabis. Um, and unfortunately, because of that, it's still Schedule 1, which is no medical utility and high abuse liability, neither of which is true for cannabis. Uh, that It's just um, based on sort of historical and political factors, not on any medical reality. And a lot of the research has been suppressed. They've only, over the last 50 years, um, funded research into harms of cannabis, not into benefits. But absence of evidence is not evidence of absence of benefit. It just means they haven't funded the research and it's getting done in other, in other countries. But the research is coming out every day now that it's lifting in other countries and it's slowly starting to lift here. But there are many different types of research. Um, I mean, it's like how many people do you have to talk to to believe that it works for sleep? I mean, I've spoken, I've seen test testimonials for like thousands of people that it, that it works for sleep. Now for other indications, like does it cure cancer? Then you really do need the randomized controlled trial 
because you don't want people using cannabis instead of chemotherapy. So for certain indications, we do need more research. But no responsible doctor would use cannabis for something like that until you do have more research. But for symptom alleviation, we have more than enough research that it helps with pain, with insomnia, with like stomach cramping, with spasms and multiple sclerosis, with tremor in Parkinson's disease. And, um, you know, can I, there's just this really interesting study that came out uh, from Harvard uh, by Stacy Gruber. She's a phenomenal cannabis researcher. She actually studied the cognitive effects of recreational cannabis and people did have some short-term memory loss. And then she studied the cognitive effects of people using medical cannabis and their cognitive performance actually improved. It was really interesting. And the question is, why would your cognitive performance improve with medical cannabis? And, you know, she speculated, they, they're still looking into it, that when people are actually sleeping and they're not in chronic pain and they're not completely stressed out, maybe their cognitive function will improve. And it wasn't just on tests. It was their brain scans looked like they were actually healing when they were using the medical cannabis. They also speculated maybe it was because of what I mentioned before, the levels of the THC, the active ingredient were lower, and the levels of some of the medicinal uh, other, other ingredients were higher. But it's really not the same thing when you're using it medicinally as when you're using it recreationally. And it just really improves people's quality of life. And the other thing that we haven't touched on yet is it can really greatly reduce people's reliance on other pills. When people start using medical cannabis, they don't need the opiates. They don't need the sedatives. When they legalized medical cannabis in Colorado, across the board prescriptions went down. I mean, people didn't need to take all kinds of pills. And that was such a big win because especially as you get older, polypharmacy, the fact that like our elderly people are on like 14 different medications is really dangerous. They confuse the medications, the medications interact with each other. And if you could take a, a more natural, safer plant-based medication, which again is not without any harms, but as long as it's monitored by a physician, you could really have a lot of harm reduction by getting rid of a lot of these extra medications. Yeah. And, you know, yes, we are going to get to that, obviously, before we end. But I, I want to go over a point you just made that and while you were talking, it, it always sticks out to me. And and people need to understand this part of it. Uh, the medicinal use of cannabis, when physicians are using it to treat symptoms uh, of patients and, and there's data that you just talked about, it's not it's not the same as recreational. It's not the same dosing. It's, you know, it, it's just not the same. And people on, on, on one side of the argument want to say, well, we're going to, you're going to be addicted to it. You're, you know, they want to use that. And, and they really, they really mix the recreational with the medicinal. And we have had other uh, doctors uh, tell us that, listen, in therapeutic doses, it's the, and, and they're always talking about THC. The THC level doesn't have to be so high like and obviously when you're doing recreational you're doing it for other reasons we're talking about medicinal medicine and and uh, you know expound on that if you want to but you you were saying it earlier that you know in medicinally you can lower things like thc and and raise other components and that's what we're talking about it doesn't you know people want to equate medicinal cannabis to well there goes that there goes everything because we're going to have people that are high walking around and we can't do anything and that's just not necessarily true because it's it can be controlled. It, we can we know the levels of THC. No, absolutely. Some of the doses can be very low for medicinal. I mean, it depends a little bit on the patient. Sure. If it's a veteran with a traumatic brain injury, they might need high doses. If it's an elderly person with some chronic arthritis, they might need just two milligrams of T THC. And a puff is like five to ten, like less than even a puff. One puff, like just a teeniest little bit. So it really ranges. But the other thing to keep in mind is that one thing that's really remarkable about cannabis is the more you use it, the less it impairs you. So if a recreational user uses it like once a month, they'll be like completely impaired. Whereas if a medical user uses a small dose twice a day, they, they shouldn't drive. We recommend you don't drive. But in reality, they don't get that impaired if you use a small dose twice a day because your body really adjusts to it. So it's not like you're going to have impaired people 
roving around because yeah. again, the doses are much lower. Number one, number two, according to Dr. Stacy Gruber's work at Harvard, which I just alluded to, your cognitive function can improve if you're not up all night in agony with chronic pain. And number three, you develop this tolerance to it. So with the lower doses, the improvements that you can see in cognitive function and the tolerance, um, people can function uh, very well with it. And they're just a lot less miserable. Yeah. Uh, they're just well, happier people. Yes. And that's what, you know, it's, it's a quality of life thing. I think it's a, a it's a pro-life situation where we've got to look at people's quality of life and they're really down a chronic pain. I've got a family member that uh, is dealing with that now, a close family member. Um, and, and he is absolutely miserable. Uh, can't sleep. I don't think he's had a good uh, night's sleep in a long time. I talk to him every day. I love the uh, truth. I can yeah. get it. <laughs> so. Yeah. And, and it's one of these things to where that, that's kind of where I am here now is, is you know, and I believe I mentioned this uh, off offline with you is, you know, people want to look at me and say, well, you were only for CBD when my daughter Carly was, was, we were just wanting to try it because we had read the story of uh, Charlotte Figgy in Colorado. And I went out and visited and, and came back and said, we've got to do something for children here in Alabama. So that's when we started that. And that's all I, that's all I was really about. And that's true until more data is just, it starts piling up and it, it, it becomes to where you can't ignore it. And then, uh, and I've told this story several times on this, uh, on these type of programs, when Slavarsky comes to me and says, you know, we need another medical cannabis program or a true one, a, a real bill. It, there was five of us. There was five of us that sat in my office and wrote the first uh, version of this bill that's kind of making its way through now. Now it's been amended uh, many different times but there, there is nothing behind our intentions here other than what you say is this trying to help the people that are suffering uh, with chronic pain, with uh, ALS for and MS, spasticity uh, symptoms that, are, that can be symptomatic, I'm sure, on a lot of things that we have got to help these people. And in my opinion, it's it's our duty, uh, in my opinion, uh, to to meet people at the greatest uh, need of suffering. And we have those. And if and if you guys up in Massachusetts and we've got physicians in Massachusetts helping their patients and it being regulated, that's obviously what we're trying to do here. And I think that obviously is, is where it is. I mean, and, it, and it's the human factor to me. It's, it's that people are suffering. There's physicians like you and others in Alabama. They just released a study. UAB just did a study. Uh, the Lister Hill Center at UAB uh, funded a study that shows 70% of Alabama physicians approve of medical cannabis. Right. And the 30 that don't, it's just because they don't understand it because any physician would want to help their patients. There's like a small, very vocal minority of physicians that are still living in the 1950s that are just like stridently against it. But most physicians that I interact with, and I interact with a ton of physicians are really interested in learning about it. And they've learned a lot about from their patients. You know, my father used to say, you know, if you don't have good data, you have to do something radical that doctors have done for thousands of years, which is you have to listen to and trust your patients. And with cannabis, sometimes it, it comes down to that. But what I find remarkable is that cannabis is one of the few um, issues that really unites people. It's not just liberal Massachusetts, like Southern states are enacting uh, medical cannabis all over the place. And you know, my Twitter following has people from all stripes of the political spectrum. Uh, you know, I have like Republicans for cannabis legalization, conservatives for cannabis legalization, just as much as I have like people, progressives, I have people all over the place. And I just think it's amazing that, I mean, when you have, again, 94% of Americans are in favor of medical cannabis, it doesn't leave much room for any particular stripe of um, ideology or political opinion to be against it. I mean, that's only 6% that are against it. I know four or five of these people, so I don't know who the other 6% are, but it's, um, and I suspect some of them are down in Alabama. They could be. Yeah. Uh, but it's really amazing how medical cannabis has united this country and just the humanity and the fact that people want compassion for their patients. It's really incredible how much of a groundswell it is. And we're having incredible success in Massachusetts, but there's been incredible success in Florida. And there's been incredible success in a whole host of states from 
all with all kinds of uh, leadership uh, across the political spectrum. So I just think it's really amazing that in this day and age where unfortunately everybody's so polarized, cannabis of all things is like the one issue because in the 1960s it used to polarize people. But now medical cannabis ironically is like the one issue that like almost everybody is agreeing upon. Yeah. And, you know, I think that, you know, obviously there's a lot that we could talk about there, but it's, it is interesting. And and I will be the one that I will I'm, try to be as transparent as I can is, you know, 10 years ago, my daughter is 10. Um, she turned 10 uh, last, this past February. Uh, she has a, a, a pretty awful uh, disorder called CDKL5 deficiency disorder. It's a, a intractable epilepsy disorder. Uh, when she was having two to 300 seizures a day, uh, 10 or 12 tonic clonic, just absolutely rough to deal with uh, seizures that changes your life. Um, it, it, and when, when you, when there is a helpless feeling, uh, especially when it's your own child and you don't know what to do, no, no conventional medicine helped. And that's where we turned to the CBD uh, movement that was going on or really just cranking up back in 2013. And I will tell you, it is something when my daughter uh, had her first dose um, of CBD oil, it was really only it was the second dose that we really saw a difference. Uh, we, we her seizure, uh, the seizure, uh, the reduction of seizures, the um, the duration of seizures were cut short uh, or shorter. Uh, she's not seizure free. And I tell everybody that listens to my story, obviously, that, you know, CBD oil and, and medical cannabis is not a silver bullet for everything. But I will tell you, it is a good feeling that I know that I help my child out. And my mind and my viewpoints of medical cannabis changed over the last decade. And it's because I was personally impacted. And, and I not only personally impacted and saw my daughter get help, but wanting so much for other people to have that strand of hope to provide that to them. If my daughter can get that kind of help. And now we have physicians, like you just said, uh, uh, there's so many, a high percentage of, of, of physicians. Now we know in Alabama with that great study, 70% want to help their physicians. If I can help my daughter and she can get help, why are we not wanting to do that? And I think the compassion, the compassion for me uh, just went through the roof. And I, I really, uh, I ha my mind was changed um, prob pre I guess uh, 11 years ago, before my daughter was born, I would have been one of the bigger skeptics. I really would. Um, uh, you know, I'm a former police officer. Um, I've arrested many people. And I'm, I'm telling you, my, my viewpoint on cannabis as medicine on the medicinal part of it has changed. And so I think what you see with that, hopefully, is people wanting to help other people. And the data is not, you know, the the we can sit here and say, well, there's not been enough research, but there has. If you just go out there and Google, for goodness sakes, you can see the research. But goodness gracious, when the data gets so insert, you can't get around the data anymore. What are we doing? We've got to help be compassionate. Now, do I think there needs to be more research? Of course I do. I think there needs to be more research. I think there needs to be a, you know, it could be helping something we don't know about, but we can't research it. Um, so there does need to be more research done. But a lot of people in our, in our state, in our country, they're in a position now, Dr. Grinspoon, that they can't wait on results of, of two and three and four year studies. They just can't wait. Right. And unfortunately, there are people that misconstrue the data. Like with cannabis, you can pick all the studies that show a benefit and paint a very rosy picture. And you could pick all the studies that don't show benefit and paint a negative picture. And the truth is obvious, nuanced and in between. And I saw some of the materials you were confronting down there, and it was just very dishonest how they were trying to paint a case against cannabis. I mean, the fact is, there isn't a single state that has legalized medical cannabis that's trying to unlegalize it. It's been a success socially for every single state that's, that's legalized it. The patients are doing better. Ironically, alcohol use goes down. Uh, the prescription, other prescription drugs are going down. Um, you know, the revenue helps the states. That's not why they do it, but it doesn't hurt that the states are getting all this revenue. The main problem we have is that it's hard to get rid of the illicit market. Um, but that's a problem that no one knows how to solve. But before you legalize it, 100% of the market is the illicit market. <laughs> well, so now, if half the market is the illicit market, yeah. at least you've got half of it. But, you know, if you tax cannabis higher, you get more revenue for the state, but then there's more of a price differential between the legal and the illegal cannabis. Right. And if you tax it less, 
you get less revenue, but then you have less of an illicit market. You know, it's just an economics question that nobody knows the answer to. But, you know, there are things that are still being worked out, like what the right level to tax it at is and stuff like that. But generally speaking, it's been like phenomenally successful. Yeah. And, you know, and these it's a lot of the, the talking points opposition has is a lot of fear tactics. Uh, you know, it's you know, I think I've read where uh, cannabis uh, is. Uh, I think I, I believe this is how it is. I'm, don't quote me uh, paraphrasing here, but it, it it is the it was one of the leading causes of mass murder. Um, <laughs> I mean, and so when you read stuff like that, there there are people well, out there that I guess listen to Alex Berenson's work. And he I debated him at Yale last, law school and you've never seen a bigger slaughter than my debate with him. I well, tell me about that. No, no, please, I, do, please do. Please do. I, I put so much pressure on him in that debate because he didn't really know anything and he hadn't ever de really debated a doctor before. Um, and I'm a pretty good debater that he got to a point where he said, quote, the entire medical and scientific establishment is wrong and I'm right. So when someone's in that position, you know, they're sort of losing the debate. And now what does he do? Is he still doing cannabis? No, he's on Fox news. He's one of the country's leading COVID deniers. He migrated from cannabis to COVID denialism. And he's the one that came up with the theory that cannabis causes uh, violence. What he says is that cannabis causes psychosis. It is unclear whether cannabis causes psychosis. Cannabis is associated with psychosis and they manipulate that. Association is not causation. Um, it, they're genetically linked, schizophrenia and cannabis, and we don't know what causes what. Um, and then um, he's saying psychos psychotic people are violent. In reality, people who suffer from psychosis are much more likely to be victims of violence, not um, perpetrators of violence. So actually he was um, he was digging up these old tropes of mentally ill people as violent. And he was causing a lot of harm to the mentally ill community. So he he was just wrong all over the place. And his book was very dishonest. And he literally got chased out of the academic community by everybody. Like he's completely discredited. And it just astounds me that they're still harping on this because literally that in particular, nobody believes. And then, you know, they'll say things like cannabis causes suicide. Cannabis may be associated with suicide, but it could be the people who are distressed use cannabis to self-treat their anxiety and depression. That means they're self-treating themselves. It doesn't mean the cannabis is causing the suicide. It's so manipulative and dishonest. It just takes advantage of the fact that people haven't studied statistics to say that it causes it. So a lot of the stuff that they're using as talking points is just nonsense uh, that you showed me. It's like causation, correlation is not causation. I mean, there are more drownings in the summer and there's more ice cream use in the summer. But that doesn't mean that the increased use of ice cream causes the drownings. They're correlated, but one doesn't cause the other. It's very dishonest the way they use those arguments. Yeah, it is. And, and you know, it's important that, you know, a lot of times when they start with those arguments, uh, they're really talking about recreational use. I don't know how many, and of course, I don't know what the statistics show, have a, a medical cannabis card that has a, is in care of a physician. When they start talking about this, the, the, these fear tactics that they say is going to happen if we legalize uh, cannabis for medicinal purposes. I think it's, I think it's a dishonest approach. I don't think it's very, um, it's not honest. It's um, I think they grasp at straws because they know the data is there that supports uh, the use of medical cannabis. And listen down here when, and, and I, I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. When you have 70% uh, physicians in Alabama support medical cannabis, uh, you know, support it. You have about 52 percent, 53 percent of the DAs that have come out against it. Right. That should that should really tell you something. And I, I tell people all the time, well, you know, I don't go to a DA and ask for health advice and I don't go to a doctor and ask for legal advice. And right. in, in this in this and I'll give you the last word. And, and now I want to talk about one more thing before we get out of here. But in this realm, in this topic that we are talking about, we have good physicians in Alabama, we have got some of the top notch doctors uh, in the country. Uh, we've got experts like you are telling us the data is out there. Let's read it. And we have physicians who want to help. We've got to listen to physicians. 
the opposition will say, well, you know, we were in an opioid crisis because they got out of control, which, OK, I, you know, we're not talking about that. We're talking about this system and physicians wanting to help. What's the best way to do that? Now, when they talk about being in an opioid crisis, which I firmly believe we are, I want you to talk a little bit about, and that's what we'll kind of end with, on the opioid crisis and how do you think that that um, medical cannabis can help us with that crisis that we're that we still are currently in, uh, and how does that play a role in helping reduce that? And what do you have to say about the the opiate crisis and medical cannabis? Oh, I have a lot to say about that, but I'll be succinct. First of all, I saw in the talking points the opposition's using, they're still talking about the gateway theory. Nobody believes in the gateway theory. Using cannabis does not lead to other drugs. Uh, if anything does, it's alcohol and tobacco. But the fact is, 100% of children drank milk, and 100% of people that went on to use heroin drank milk as children. So are they going to say that milk is a gateway to heroin use? I mean, it's just... That's another example of correlation isn't causation. It's completely dishonest. So I was very disappointed that um, they're still talking about the gateway theory and how cannabis somehow, but it actually is a gateway in one sense is that it can be a very powerful gateway out of the opiate crisis. So we're starting to think that cannabis is a gateway, but it's a gateway out of the opiate crisis. It, to the extent that we're using it quite increasingly frequently instead of opiates for chronic pain, fewer people are becoming dependent on opiates. And if a patient's motivated and interested, I'm happy to substitute chronic opiate therapy for, for chronic cannabis therapy. And I've had a lot of success with this. And you also can use cannabis for some of the opiate withdrawal symptoms as you're transi transitioning someone, say they're unfortunately addicted to pills or they're addicted to heroin and you're getting them onto some kind of medication assisted treatment like uh, Suboxone, cannabis can be really helpful in helping them get off of the, um, of the heroin, um, or of the Oxycontin. So cannabis can really help you save lives in the opiate crisis. So we found it to be incredibly effective and it just goes to reason that say you have a new patient and they have chronic pain. If you treat them with cannabis where it's impossible to overdose and impossible to die, you're going to have a better outcome than if you treat them with opiates where you can which is much more addictive. I mean, cannabis can be addictive, but it's been very exaggerated over the ages. And um, you could definitely develop a dependence on it, but it's not nearly as addictive as opiates. And you, again, you cannot overdose on cannabis. You have to smoke something like 50 times your body weight in 10 minutes, which is physically impossible. Um, so the more we use cannabis instead of opiates for chronic pain, the fewer opiate overdoses we're going to have and the fewer opiate related complications is just like a very simple argument. So we we're finding it to be very successful to help us with the opiate crisis and with the chronic pain crisis too. I mean, people are desperate to get their chronic pain treated. And for a whole variety of reasons, doctors are now sort of afraid to prescribe opiates, like the government's put a lot of pressure on doctors and opiates have gotten a bad name. And, you know, without commenting on that, we have to treat people's chronic pain and cannabis just gives us a much safer and versatile uh, tool to treat that. So for a lot of different reasons, uh, the cannabis is really helping us navigate our way out of the opiate crisis. Of course, uh, the pandemic didn't help. So we're like behind where we were a couple years ago. But I truly believe that if it weren't for the pandemic, with the uh, liberalization of medical cannabis laws, I think we'd be making a lot of progress. Yeah. And, you know, it's and it's important for people that listen to this uh, whenever they do listen to this, that, you know, Alabama's law uh, is very regulated. Uh, it has a physician's uh, oversight uh, there. You know, it's very regulated. I encourage everybody that is talking about this because it is coming up for a vote. We think uh, very soon there's only three session days left. So we are very close to Sendai here, and so it's going to end. We hope it gets a vote, but please read the bill. Uh, you know, read the bill and understand everything that goes along with it, not just listening to, to me. Uh, don't listen to me. Read it yourself. I know it's 92 pages. It can be a cure for insomnia, actually. <laughs> um, but, you know, go read the bill. And, and when you hear the opposition talking, if you may agree with them, but please read the bill and know that, you know, in our bill in Alabama, um, there's no smokable. Uh, there's no vaping. We've said that before. I mean, that's those are things that people need to understand 
I'm going to put a ticker up here just for people that may see this. I want them to know, you know, and, and I say this every time, Dr. Grinspoon, that if anybody is considering CBD or any cannabis based products, they need to consult with a physician. I truly believe that. Don't go uh, don't go trying this yourself. Doctors are out there that know uh, and you can talk in private with them. But please don't do this on your own, uh, regardless of what you've heard here today. But you got to talk to a physician. And that's really what our bill does. It doesn't allow you to uh, to smoke it and to vape it and to do this on your own. It really is a good bill that Senator Melson uh, in the Alabama Senate uh, has been pushing uh, this whole session. So just I just encourage people to read the bill before they listen to the to the opposition or the proponents of the bill. Go read it yourself and look at the list of conditions. They've tightened those up. Um, and it's, it's truly is, it's, it really is a bill that we are trying to allow physicians that want to, they're not forced to, not, nobody is forcing a physician to do anything. We're just allowing the physicians that want to, to learn more about it. There's an educational component. They've got to go get their hours to learn about this to, if they want to help their patients with this and that they, uh, that they can. So, um, I'll give you the last word if you want the last word and we'll wrap it up. I just, I really appreciate your time, Dr. Grinspoon. Listen, I've, I've read a lot of your stuff um, and and really on this topic and uh, obviously following you on Twitter and other places. I, I really appreciate what you've done, really helping educate me, uh, educating a lot of people that follow your work and, and for people to come to the table. And this is really just the way I'll end this. And when we're talking about cannabis and medicine is really come with an open mind and a kind heart. Um you know, I, I understand because I, I come from that as well, that I was closed minded. I thought there was really only way uh, what opened up my eyes and really opened up my heart was my child. Uh, and now I, I see this as a great opportunity to help those suffering. So uh, that's what I wish people would do. But I'll give you the last word. But I do want to say thank you before we end this. I mean, I really appreciate your time. You're really a, uh, a rock star to me. Uh, so just having this time with you, this short period of time we had, with us, I'm very thankful of your time and, and everything that you've done for the community. Well, thanks for having me. And I just want to say, sort of echo what you were saying as the last word. Um, when my brother was dying of cancer, like medical cannabis allowed him to live with dignity and to die in comfort. And when my dad was dying, medical cannabis helped him to die with comfort. And when my patients that I use medical cannabis, which isn't all my patients, I do it as part of my primary care practice. It's not, I'm not a medical cannabis doctor. I mean, I consult, but I'm a primary care doctor that with some patients I use medical cannabis. It just gives me such a good tool to use with these patients. Um, and my patients, I can make them so comfortable for some of these conditions that you can't reach otherwise. And just, if you have a family member that has one of these conditions, you're really going to want them to have the option of using medical cannabis. Now that doesn't mean you're necessarily going to want them to choose medical cannabis or they're going to want to choose it. But with healthcare, you want as many options as you have, because it's all about avoiding suffering and medical cannabis is so good for avoiding suffering that I'm just, I'm just saying that when you come to the point where you're crossing the bridge with a, a really sick family member or yourself, you're just going to want access to it because it helps people. It makes them more comfortable and it improves their quality of life. So don't fall for the, for the 1950s propaganda about the evil weed. It's a medicinal plant. It has some harms, but we can manage the harms like we do with every other medication that we prescribe. And I would just encourage you to give yourselves the option because one day you might really need it for your family and it helps a lot of people. And again, thank you for having me on your show. No, thank you very much. And I'm going to end it right there, Dr. Grinspoon. I'll be back with you in a second. But guys, I appreciate you listening. Dr. Grinspoon, you can follow him on Twitter. Uh, go find him uh, out there on Twitter. He puts out a lot of great information for us. And uh, until next time, uh, like I always say, love wins, everybody.